I was up all night, not all night. I was up and I was asleep and awake all night long, back and forth. And I thought, whoa, should I preach the sermon I prepared or preach something different this morning? Now, I've decided to go with what I've prepared. But I do understand that all of us are worried about and thinking about how we can help people, how we can uh, provide, where we can step in. And so we are going to try to continue to look for those ways. And if you know specifically of any of those things that we need to do, I would encourage you to let us know about it. But I wanted to do something to start off that was a little different. I want you to look around where you're sitting, and if there's no, if there's people there that are normally near you that are not near you, and you have their phone number, I'm giving you permission right now. Take your phone out and text them, and tell them you miss them, and see if they need anything. So just go ahead and do that. If they respond back during my sermon, that's all right. You can respond. So when you're texting them right now, that's fine. Now don't call them, but text them, and let them know. You're thinking about them, so do that as we're getting ready to start here. So look down the aisle for someone there that's normally there that's not there. Give them an old text. All right, here we go. What do you think of when you hear the term leap of faith? What, what comes to mind? Uh, if you Google that term, uh, it comes up with some different answers, but there's, they say it's an idiom that means to believe something that is unprovable or to do something risky in the hopes of a positive outcome, or the act of believing something that's not easily believed. Um, for most people, that's how they look at the walk of faith. They, they look at it as if it is a leap of faith. They, they approach God in walking with him in faith as something that is unknowable, that is risky, that is unbelievable, and has little proof or reason by which to follow but they would be wrong. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it defines faith for, the, for us. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Yeah, we've read this before, even in this series. This idea that faith is confidence and assurance in what we don't see, but that doesn't mean that it is based on intuition or us just merely wishing something would happen. It is based completely on what God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. In fact, talking about faith, Peter talks about it like this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with the generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control, self-control with patient endurance, patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says, listen, our faith is something that grows. Our faith is something that stretches. Our faith is something that continues to not only affect what we do, but it affects the lives of those around us because we're interacting with people differently than we once did. So how do we get to the place that we, you and I, can live with such great faith that it not only transforms our lives, but starts to spill over into the lives of all those that are around us? What does that look like? What aha moment needs to happen for us to walk or leap with faith? For that, I want us to look at uh, Genesis chapter 24. We're going to look back at Abraham. We're going to start with verse 1 and read through verse 8. This is what it says. Abraham was now a very old man, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. One day Abraham said to his oldest servant, the man in charge of his household, take an oath by putting your hand under my thigh. Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not allow my son to marry one of these local Canaanite women. Go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son Isaac. The servant asked, but what if I can't find a young woman who is willing to travel so far from home? Should I, take, should I then take Isaac there to live among your relatives in the land you came from? No, Abraham responded. Be careful never to take my son there. 
For the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my native land, solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you, and he will see to it that you will find a wife there for my son. If she is unwilling to come back with you, then you are free from this oath of mine. But under no circumstances are you to take my son there. Now I want to start off by looking at this. Abraham is probably 140 years old. He's somewhere between like 137 to 140 years old. And at 140 years old, it appears at least that Abraham has finally got to the point that he is going to walk by faith. It has taken him to like 140 years old to where he can actually walk trusting in God like you should. Now, he says, I don't want you to take my son over there, and I don't want my son to marry someone from over here, and so I need you to go get a wife for my son and bring her back. Now, the reason he doesn't want his son to go over there is because he said, God's promised me this land. He's got faith that God's going to give him this land. So he says, we're not leaving this land. This is ours. So God's got that taken care of. And then he says, oh, and by the way, if she doesn't come back with you, hey, don't worry about it. You're no longer bound by the oath. Because it appears that he assumes that, you know what? I'll trust that God will take care of that another way if she won't come back. If you can't find a wife there, God will take care of that problem as well. And so we get to Abraham here, and we see that Abraham is finally walking in faith with the Lord. And here's the first thing we need to understand. If we want to have that aha moment, if we want to walk by faith, if we want to be those people who jump out there and, and are actually doing what God's called us to do, we have to, first of all, believe that God's promises are certain. We have to just believe that. We have to trust that. We have to accept that. We have to live with that belief and trust in our hearts. If God says it, then it is, period. There is no uncertainty to it. There is no flip-flopping to it. It is the truth, and it is guaranteed it is going to happen. If God says it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes And through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us and has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a first installment that guarantees everything he has promised to us. You and I, we need to get to that realization in our lives. There is Nothing that God has promised that will not come to fruition. It all will happen as God said, as God said. That gives us freedom. That gives us freedom to walk in faith. We we no longer have to worry about whether this will happen or that will happen. We no longer have to worry about whether God can get this done or that done because we know that whatever God says he's going to do, he's going to do. I found this quote from Joni Erickson Tata. This is what she said. She said, just think, every promise God has ever made finds its fulfillment in Jesus. God doesn't just give us grace. He gives us Jesus, the Lord of grace. If it's peace, it's only found in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Even life itself is found in the resurrection and the life. Christianity isn't all that complicated. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. In Romans 8, verse 28, this is what it says. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. If you and I love God, and if you and I are serving God and his purpose, then he's going to work out everything for our good. That's a promise, which means that that's a certainty. He will work it out for our good one way or another. That's what God promises in Matthew 16, 18. Now I say to you, say that you, to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus says, hell's powers are no match for the church. It can't stand against the church. It cannot overpower the church. It will not have victory 
over the church. The church is the mighty force. The church is the place where victory is found. The church is going to succeed. In John 4.4, 4, 1 John 4.4, 4, but you belong to God, my dear children. You've already won a victory over these, those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. I want you to understand these are promise after promise after promise. You and I should be living differently. I found this quote. It says, because we have been so willing to accommodate the message of the Bible to the limitations of contemporary culture, the modern world does not regard the church as a threat. I suspect that it regards us as merely boring. We are giving the modern world less and less in which to, to disbelieve because it, seem, it senses no difference between what the church is saying and what is being said by a variety of secular voices. The world, which once imprisoned our ancestors, now responds to an utterly enculturated church with mere indifference. We need to be a living, active, bold, out there, showing the world what it looks like to be a Christ follower kind of church. We need to be securely living on the promises our Lord has proclaimed in his word. We need to live in such a way that there is no denying there is a difference between how we live and how the world lives, between our actions and priorities and the world's actions and its priorities. I was thinking about it as I was thinking about all that has happened in this last uh, few days. And I, I remember hearing people say, talking about in the good old days, in the good old days, so-and-so, he would give you the shirt off his back. You know, you ever hear that? Give you the shirt right off his back. In the good old days, if you came hungry, no matter how little food they had in their house, she would make sure that you got a meal and send you away with a pack of lunch. In the good old days, if you didn't have somewhere to stay, you would just go and someone would, in the community would let you come on in and, and show hospitality and put you up until you could find a place to stay. You know what? The good old days are only the good old days if we don't keep doing those things right now. If we do them now, they're the now days. They're the right now days. If there's someone that you know that's hurting, you can do that right now. You can help them right now. You can give them the shirt off your back right now. I'm not going to do that because I don't want everybody to run screaming away from the room. But you can do that. It's only the good old days if we stop doing it. We could be doing that right now. Are we doing that right now? Because the world needs to see something different in the church, in the Christians' lives. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe your eternity is secure in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that God has empowered you for the work that God has called you to do? Do you believe that the church is unstoppable? Do you believe that God is in control? Do you believe that Jesus is the only answer? Do you believe that God will finish his work in you? Do you believe that you are on a mission for the Lord? Because if you do, then you and I need to be living a completely different kind of life. Completely transformed by what God is doing in our lives and what God has promised to do in our lives. So right off the bat, when we look at Abraham, we see that he is finally... Walking by faith. He's trusting the promises. Even though he can't see how it's going to get done, he's still trusting the promise. He believes what God says. Now we're going to continue. 9 through 24. Back in our text, this is what it says. So the servant took an oath by putting his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham. He swore to follow Abraham's instructions. Then he loaded 10 of Abraham's camels and all kinds of expensive gifts from his master. And he traveled to the distant traveled to distant Aram Naharaim. There he went to the town where Abraham's brother Nahor had settled. He made the camels kneel beside a well just outside the town. It was evening and the women were coming out to draw water. O oh Lord, God, my master, excuse me, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed, please give me success today and show unfailing love to your master Abraham. See, I am standing here beside the spring and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says yes, have a drink, 
And I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you, are, you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know that you have shown unfailing love to my master. Before he had finished praying, he saw a young woman named Rebekah coming out with her water jug on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor and his wife Milcah. Rebekah was, a very beautiful, was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but she was still a virgin. She went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up again. Running over to her, the servant said, Please give me a little drink of water from your jug. Yes, my lord, she answered. Have a drink. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. When she had given him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw water for all the camels. The second thing we need to do, if we want to live by faith, is we need to prepare for God's work. I want you to understand this servant, which is not named here. We believe it's Eleazar, which is named in chapter 15. But we're not positive of that. But this servant, possibly Eleazar, after he makes this uh, oath, after he takes this oath with Abraham, you know what he does immediately? He starts loading up the camels. You know what he's loading them up with? He's loading them up with a dowry. That's what he's loading them up with. He's going to travel 400 and 50 miles on camelback. That's what he's doing. It's going to take like a month to travel there. And he's loaded up with all the dowry he's going to leave to get a bride for his master's son, Isaac. He is going with the assumption that God is going to provide. Not only that, when he gets there, he just asks God right out, hey, can you, can you provide a bride for Isaac? In fact, will, will you identify her by letting her give me something to drink and then watering all these camels? Which, by the way, would have been a huge task to water all these camels. So she would have been going back and forth for quite some time to water all these camels. He acts. He acts. He prepares. He does everything he can to get ready. Now think about it. He could have dragged his feet. He could have complained about how far and how long and how hard this trip was going to be. He could have got there when he got, you know, got 450 miles from home and he could have just sat down there and done nothing. Just waiting for someone to walk up to him and, and ask him, hey, what are you here for? He could have uh, spent all of his master's money and just hung out there until couldn't find anybody and went home. He could have done any of those things, but he does none of those things. He gets prepared. He always gets prepared. That's what he does. That's what we ought to do. Prepare for God to work in us and through us all the time. Well, I don't know what God's going to want from me. Well, get prepared anyway. Get everything you can, as prepared as you can, for God to work in your life. We need to live our lives believing that God's plan is going to come to fruition in our lives. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, read this before, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by Faith. Noah builds an ark when it appears that rain has not ever even happened in the past. Abraham, we read this two weeks ago. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God had, was testing him. Abraham had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his, one, his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Abraham proceeds. He's prepared. Even though they've never even seen someone raised from the dead to this point. But Abraham believes, well, maybe God will just bring him back from the dead. And then verse 30, it says, goes on. It says, it was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. 
You ever think about that story? You're walking around Jericho the first day. Okay, that's, that's something. Mile around maybe or however long it was around there. And then the second day, third day, you get to the sixth day, you're walking around it and you're like, man, this is getting a little old. And the seventh day, you walk around it seven times. Can you imagine you're walking around on the sixth time, you're still like, what is the point? On the seventh time, you finally make it back around and you shout and the walls fall in and you're like, that was the point. That was the point. God wanted them to walk by faith. We all need an aha moment when we realize the plan is not, is <laughs> the plan is always for us to trust God is in control and that that is all that is necessary for God to be in control. It doesn't have to do with me and my strength. It just has to do with God and His plans. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know this wasn't directly written for us, but I think the same applies to us. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. That's us. That's what you and I have. We've been given that. See, Scott Bozerth coaches two youth basketball teams in New Jersey. In 2022, it was a good year for the teams. Both teams made a championship run that season. Now, if you could coach multiple teams, having a single team advance into the league tournament is no small accomplishment, but he had both of his teams uh, advance into the tournament. He and the parents of the youth on his team credit his can-do attitude with his success. 12-year-old uh, Abrux Hannah had only stepped on the court for the first time this year. Anytime I say I can do, can't do something, Coach Scott always tells me that I can, said Hannah. I feel like he's made a really big difference in my life. Parents agree that Coach Scott's uh, can-do attitude has sparked a positive change in their children. And Coach Scott knows a thing or two about working through challenges because he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at birth, hinder, hindering the muscles on his left side of his body. That includes his left hand, which does not function as well as the right. In spite of that, he grew up playing basketball. He carried that passion into his adult life, into his adult life where he coaches two teams in the Herb Henry Youth Basketball League. He believes his role is to do more than simply teach technical skills. He summarizes his role in a recent interview in 2022 like this. He says, I love challenges. So what I thought is, if God gave me a hand to play, I'm going to play like that. I'm going to play like that. I'm going to do the best I can do. Let me ask you a question. Is that you and me? He could have easily just figured, he could have easily just focused on what he could not do, what was getting in the way that he had less to offer than other people did. But instead, he says, I'm going to do everything I can with what God has blessed me with, with what God has given me. I'm going to prepare myself to work for the Lord regardless. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 9. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I dis discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what I sh what it should, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. We are doing everything. Are we doing everything we can to prepare ourselves for God to work in us and through us in this world? Last thing, end of this chapter, verses 61 through 67. This is what it says. Then Rebekah and her servant girls mounted the camels and followed the man. So Abraham's servant took Rebekah and went on his way. Meanwhile, Isaac, whose name was in the, whose home was in the Negev, had returned from Bear Lahai Roy one evening as he was walking and meditating in the fields. 
He looked up and saw the camels coming. When Rebekah looked up and saw Isaac, she quickly dismounted from her camel. Who is that man walking through the fields to meet us? She asked the servant. And he replied, it is my master. So Rebekah covered her face with her veil. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done. And Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother Sarah's tent and she became his wife. He loved her deeply and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. And that leads me to the last thing, and that is that we need to keep focused on God. I love what Isaac's doing. It's been probably two months at this point, at least, that the servant's been gone. And what's Isaac doing? He's out in the field walking and meditating. This is a picture of a man who, even while doing his business activities, you know, making sure things are well in the, in, in the farm life, he made a priority out of focusing on God. It reminded me of what it says in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, it says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Our faith grows as our faith grows. I know that's a big profound statement. But the point is this. If we keep our focus on God, our faith grows. As, as we look at what he has done and is doing and will do in our lives, our faith grows. As we recognize what he has promised through his word, what he has fulfilled in his word, our faith grows. As, as, we, as we walk with him and talk with him and meditate on what he's done and praise him for what he's done, our faith grows. That's what happens as a Christian. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, our faith grows grows. Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher. He told the story of a goose that was wounded and had to land in a barnyard with some chickens. So he began playing with the chickens as he was trying to recover. And he ate with the chickens. And, and after a while, he just acted like a chicken. So one day, a flight of geese flew back over, migrating back home. They gave a hawk up there in the sky and this Goose heard it, and Kierkegaard said this. He said, something stirred within the breast of this goose. Something called him to the skies. He began to flap his wings that he hadn't used, and he rose a few feet off the ground, but then he all of a sudden stopped, and he settled back again into the mud of the barnyard. He heard the cry, but he settled for less. We have two choices in this life. We can keep our eyes above on what God is doing, what God wants us to be doing, our eternal purpose, or we can keep our eyes on the mud that surrounds us, the focus on our world and all of its problems. We, we can worry about all of this stuff here, or we can focus on what God wants us to focus on that has eternal consequences. We will never fly to the heights God has called us if we keep our eyes down here on the mud. If we settle for the mud, then our faith will stop growing and we will be satisfied. But that's not what God has called us to do. Ephesians 3.20 in the midst of a prayer, he says, Now all glory to God who is able to do much through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God wants to do more than you and I could dream up. God wants to be, do more than you and I could think up. God wants to do more than you and I could possibly do on our own, and he wants to do it through you and me. Are we going to trust that God can do and keep our eyes on him, or are we going to focus on this world and instead of being the goose that flies, be the chicken that sits there in the mud. See, it's leap of faith time. Our world needs us to stand out. Our world needs us to be looking beyond the here and now. Our world needs us to act differently. Our world needs us to walk with courage and confidence. 
Our world needs us to be doing the godly work that we've been called to do. And the question is, are we going to do it or not? God's promises are certain. Are we prepared to be used in those promises? Or have we been distracted by the world? We pray with me. God, we thank you for all you bless us with. And we come right now. We recognize that life is hard. In fact, we have had a very close to home um, vision, viewing of that. And our hearts go out to all those that are struggling right now. And I pray that not only will we lift them up in prayer, but that we will be ready and eager to help where and when we can. Lord, let us be that in our world all the time, every day. Let us always be ready and willing to help. Let us always be focused on what you have proclaimed and the promises you have declared. Let us always be prepared. And let us keep our focus on you and on eternal priorities. Lord, life is very short. But eternity is forever. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be transformed by the knowledge that you have secured for us those eternities through your son Jesus. Let us live in such a way that faith is seen, not just spoken of. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.